Welcome to IT Trendsetters. Today, we have Roger Grimes. Roger, welcome. Glad to be here. Hey, before we get started, I'm not going to introduce Kirk. Everyone knows who Kirk is. So we're just going to, we're going to stick straight with Roger. There's a role reversal for you. Yeah. Uh, so Roger, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I've been doing computer security 34 years, earned all of these gray hairs. I've written uh, 13 books on computer security, probably now going on 1200 magazine articles. Uh, and I do, I'm not an expert or anything in you know computer security or anything, but I have been doing it a long time. I write on a lot of subjects, probably uh, my last book was the Ransomware Protection Playbook. Before that, my uh, I wrote Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication. Thanks. And um, <laughs> here, Kurt Scott, that's great. And then uh, before that, I wrote something on quantum computers and quantum security. And then really, my, my whole magnum opus is about uh, using data to better uh, focus your cybersecurity plans. Uh, let's see, what else? I, uh, I'm on the Cloud Security Alliance for the Quantum Security Safe Team, Safe Security Team, and I'm on the World Economic Forum Team for quantum stuff as well. And I work for Know Before. I'm a data-driven defense evangelist, so I, I literally try to look at data and trends to try to help people to better defend their environments. That's really my whole reason on Earth. Uh, uh, my major reason on earth for working is I want to make the internet a far safer place. And if I don't do that before I die, I will, I consider myself having failed professionally. Uh, that's really what I'm working at. I've got, I guess about 10 years left and I hope to do it. And I'm going to go down, you know, fighting, trying to make the internet far safer for our kids and our grandparents to be on. Very, very cool. So your background is pretty interesting. I see you spent a lot of years at, as a columnist at InfoWorld. So my guess is, is that um, in that seat, you know, usually the people we bring on to these, uh, to uh, IT trendsetters, they've kind of been brought up through working for large technology companies or technology vendors, as we like to call it. So your background is actually pretty interesting because my guess is you're, you, you were looking at it from a, a very different seat. Uh, over the years. So uh, my guess is that's when you did a lot of the other writings, but can you talk a little bit about your experience as a columnist in, in this space, because a lot of this stuff didn't exist, you know, <laughs> a yeah, couple of know, years ago. Um, I always did it as a side job, uh, but I have done it since I was probably 19 or 21. And, and actually funny, just the physical experience of writing a weekly column. Like today, I probably write one to two columns a week on top of everything else. And I'm writing white papers and slide decks and all that stuff. But I, I kind of actually enjoy uh, because the writing has the writing helps me learn about new topics and new ways. I mean, a lot of times, like the quantum thing, I just want to know more about quantum computers and quantum crypto and stuff. So that's why I agreed to do the book. So a lot of times, in writing about something, you get to talk to experts and research the material, and you become you know better at it. And then I also, in my jobs during all those times, was working as a computer security professional of some sort. And I, to be honest with you, I think I was a better writer because I was somebody that was in the field really dealing with it and responding to things and security incidences and fighting ransomware and vice versa. Working in the field helped me be a better writer about what I shared. You know, they probably the, the famous saying, one of the best sayings, like Mark Manazzi, a guy that wrote the Mastering Windows series was an, a, fr a friend of mine. Uh, he's retired now, but he said, you know, try something once before you write something down and tell other people to do it. And you'd be amazed of how often writers don't do that. And you find it out when you're a practitioner because you go to do what they say and it doesn't work at all like they said it was, you know, or some instructions or documentation. So I, I guess that's what it gave me. And I really enjoyed working for InfoWorld and I wrote for CSO Magazine. I was also in the test center, a review center where I would review products and solutions and devices and appliances. And I learned things like, and uh, my 10 years of reviewing appliances, only one appliance was ever sent to me fully patched. All the rest had vulnerabilities, right? And I just learned that appliances are just harder to patch software, really. Right. And you can get out of jail and compliance requirements because you can say the vendor won't let you patch it, right? Yeah, yeah. And when I was a pen tester, because I also pen tested for 20 years, uh, a lot for Foundstone, but also for my personal companies. And I broke into every place I was ever hired to break into over 20 years, hundreds of places in an hour or less, except for one place that took me three to five hours because the second time I was there. But a lot of times I was breaking through the appliances and the security. So they'd have a, like an email gateway or they'd have a firewall. As a matter of fact, I used to smile when they're like, oh, we got hardened Linux. You know what hardened Linux means? You can't patch it. 
like the vendor has to do and the vendor either doesn't patch it or patches it once a year, twice a year. I mean, it was funny. My, my secret for breaking into every place I did was I broke into the security devices that they use to protect themselves because they're just buggy pieces of software that need to be patched too. Yep. And then some of those techniques probably still work today on your top two or three that you find every year. Ways into yeah, it yeah. You know, and then maybe that's kind of the amazing part is that the problems over the problem 30 years ago are the exact same major problems today. It's social engineering and unpatched software and shared passwords. <laughs> you know, those continue. <laughs> that is funny. The attacks have changed right now. We have attacks coming through us through Teams and OAuth emails and, you know, QuickBooks scams and all this stuff. So, the, you know, they're attacking through SMS now. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm sure the metaverse will be attacked in the future and the clouds and stuff. But really, it comes down to the safe, you know, the same basic computer security hygiene uh, that we just still haven't learned to perfect yet. I know you're, you're pretty articulate and able to uh, make concepts understandable and you do a good job of uh, root cause essence. Uh, can you explain to the crowd how quantum computing is different than regular computing and like one example without having everybody's eyes go crossed and like multiple states yeah. once and all this. Yeah, to... yeah. and let me say, in a, in a couple of minutes, you can't explain quantum computing so people understand it, right? It took me 20 years, but I will say that quantum computers, it's, it's funny, everything in the world works on quantum, everything. Like, so if you go, if you go to, you know, we used to think that everything was what's called classical physics and it worked on gravity and atoms and stuff, but atoms and protons and neutrons are made of uh, smaller things called quantum, and we call them quantum particles. If, if, once you get down to the so quarks and muons and stuff like that. So when you look at the very smallest parts of science, they really operate a whole lot differently. You know, like, like it's really strange. Yep. Like if you, you know, in the classical world, if I go to throw a rock from here to there, I can tell, well, the rock's going to be here at the beginning and it's going to be there at the end. And I can actually compute math that tells me where the rock's going to be along the arc of the path and stuff. But in quantum, the answer for any particular problem is all possible pro or all possible answers. Like that rock could be over there at the start and be here at the end and everything in between called superposition. So what's interesting about that is it allows computers that work on uh, quantum particles. Let me say everything works on quantum. So our regular traditional computers work on, you know, electrons. An electron is a, is a elementary particle, a quantum particle. And that's how CPUs work. CPUs would not work if we didn't have uh, electrons and quantum things working. The difference is that we're actually measuring the particles or the makeup of the electron and not measuring whole electrons. Like, so, you know, it, or it be a photon, a piece of light, does it go right? Does it go left? That sort of stuff. But quantum computers are able to use these quantum particles, measure them kind of like bits and, you know, like bits, ones and zeros. But instead of being ones and zeros, it's one, zero, the answer would be one, zero, and everything in between that's possible. So it really gives you, so we have things called qubits instead of bits, you get qubits. And the permutations and combinations of the storage and the computational power is such like you could fit all information about all things that have ever happened in the universe in something like 70 qubits. Yep. And we're probably in the next couple of years going to have many, many quantum computers with millions of qubits. And from my side as a computer security person, there is this race to see quantum computers will soon be sufficiently capable of breaking uh, a lot of modern day asymmetric encryption, uh, probably 90% of what we use to protect our internet and our banking, it's, you know, anything that has TLS on it or what people call S mistakenly call SSL. So to this day, it's the stuff that protects your bank cards. It's the, it's the stuff that makes your Wi-Fi routers work. The cell phones work, what's called asymmetric encryption, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, Elgamal, that sort of stuff. Well, sufficiently capable quantum computers are in the works right now, very rudimentary computers, but the entire world is spending tens of billions of dollars to get to these computers that are sufficiently capable. And let me say that today, nation states like America, like China, like Russia, are literally eavesdropping on people's communications and storing them in large secret clouds so that in the future, when they have these sufficiently capable quantum computers, they can use that computational power and superposition to crack those secrets. So that's coming. And in the process. Oh, uh, really? That's interesting. So they're storing all this for like, kind of like for future 
reference. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask yourself, how long does your organization need to keep its secret secret? Right. You know, and you yeah. could, you know, if you're in certainly in the nation state adversary field, they could be recording your conversations. But, you know, and, and let me say, what's the outside of when we're going to be able to do this? I think on the outside, 10 years would be really far down. We think it's going to be a lot closer than 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think it's going to be within five years. I even give 10 percent chance to it's actually already been done by the United States or Russia or China. And we just don't know. Let me say United States or China. Russia's not that big of a player in it. But right. that we, so they're actually already cracking secrets and we just don't know about it. I give a 10 percent chance of that being the reality because the governments are always anytime they come with new stuff that they, they don't let us know. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like McGill Air Force Base down here. They said they have the air show this year, but they're not going to have it for a few years because they got to redo the land, the, 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 the area or something. It's like, eh, it seems a little fishy to me. But um, <laughs> so based on on that, I mean, you've been preaching, you know, the keep it simple, stupid process pretty well and tie data to it. And um, if you could maybe summarize anything you're seeing different going on uh, in the industry, you know, we've talked, you already mentioned that's the, you know, the phishing and our pen testers, phishing, right? It's a common thing is ways then, patching, missing, password reuse, password spraying. Um, uh, anything you're seeing in developments in the last six months on that? Anything new? Or are you seeing people getting better, more? What are you seeing? Everybody's as terrible as always. Uh, yeah. You know, it doesn't change. That's the sad thing of being around 34 years. It doesn't really ever get better. It just seems to get worse. But I, let me say that actually, I don't think I'm an expert in anything, but I think one of my small talents is that I, because of being in the field for 34 years, I recognize growing trends faster than the next person. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, like a couple of years ago in 2019, 2020, I saw that ransomware was starting to morph to the, the double extortion data exfiltration phase. And I called, yeah. I wrote a, I wrote a talk called uh, ransom nuclear ransomware 2.0. Well, I just started talking about ransomware 3.0 and what is it? I'm starting to see the trend and it seems very likely to happen that the ransomware groups and there's we think there's at least 100 of them or 200 of them. There's, there's at least 100 ransomware groups and about 200 different ransomware software families coming out of that 100 group. And they're everything from individuals to, you know, corporate gangs and everything, nation states in between. But it seems pretty clear to me that they're starting to do all kinds of hacking well beyond ransomware and data exfiltration. They're starting to do a lot of denial of service attacks. They're starting to do data exfiltration without doing any encryption. Uh, you know, because when you encrypt data, you've got to sneak that into the, 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 the ransomware stagers, into the environment, get them across all the machines, and then fire them all off on once. Mm -hmm. uh, and during any of those times, you can be detected by antivirus or endpoint detection response software. So a lot of the guys are finding it easy to break in and just use copy commands to copy, <laughs> figure out what the crown jewels are this company cares about, copy it across the internet, and then tell them if you don't pay us, we're going to, you know, we're going to release this data publicly. And they're not doing the encryption at all. And they're still being paid at about similar rates. Right. Uh, which is kind of incredible. They're doing denial of service attacks. They're doing crypto mining. They're doing, they're using your networks as a botnet to attack other people. They're, you know, they're using your network to send out phishing, spear phishing emails to your trusted business partner. So we, we've seen all kinds of activities and they're, they're kind of breaking into a place and going, okay, what can we do? Uh, you know, what kind of things can we do? Where should we go? That sort of stuff. And they're using, the admin tools, they'll look around and go, okay, admin uses remote desktop uh, protocol, RDP, we'll use that. Or admin's using log me in, or admin's using VNC. And so they'll start to use the same types of tools to log in and to move around. So it's very hard to be detected doing that. And then now, uh, so what I call it ransomware 3.0, which is they've now kind of become these hacker for hire gangs. You know, you want to get information on your competitor, we'll do it. You know, if you want to, you know, what, and some of them are breaking in and just installing crypto mining, you know, bots to make money off of crypto. So, so I call that kind of ransomware 3.0. And if you look at the trend, that's, it's pretty clear. This is what they're doing. There's pressure on, um, so, you know, after the colonial, pi the colonial pipeline attack, uh, by that, by dark side or our evil, evil rival, whatever you want to call it. That was kind of the turning point because the ransomware created a disruption in the fuel system here and the president got involved. 
you know, it takes it takes a lot to make the president of a country get involved. And now he's calling Putin. Well, you're doing fine as long as you're kind of staying as the undetected noise. But when the president is getting involved, you've made a mistake. I don't care how much gratis that country's leader gave you. You've now created a problem for him. Uh, and so there's actually been a shutdown on the larger attacks. We're not seeing as many 10 and $25 million attacks. They're doing smaller. At the same time, uh, the, the, you know, the world's kind of responded to ransomware. We're starting to arrest some of those ransomware guys, even in Russia, which is a cyber criminal safe haven. They arrested like eight or nine affiliates. And then we arrested some ransomware guys in Ukraine. So you're starting to see this fear consolidation of the industry with a smaller bucket of money. So what are they doing? Well, what would any business person do? What are the other revenue streams that I can do? You know, and how can I perform it? So I call that kind of ransomware 3 And then I kind of predict what ransomware 4 is going to be, which is they're going to then try to do it efficiently and maximize. They're going to see every victim as a potential bag of money and they'll start to optimize the process. OK, we'll start out with we'll do a business email compromise. We'll try to get money that way. We'll install some crypto mining Trojans. Uh, you know, at slower rate so they don't detect this. Maybe we'll do some botnet rent, rent, you know, renting. Uh, we'll still, this data will still password from all the employees and we'll resell those on the market. We'll resell access to this company to other people that want to do things. And then when they finally detect us because they're monitoring emails, we'll go off and encrypt and, you know, and ask for a ransom. So I think that if you look at the, you know, the natural uh, progression of ransomware is that they're going to get more professional. Because let me say, a lot of these people think they're corporate people. They talk corporately. They talk about upgrade cycles and you know competition's good. But I think our feature set is really you know competitive, and I think we'll do good. You know, like even the ran- when the Colonial Pipeline thing happened, that ransomware guy was like the ransomware leader. He was talking. He's like. You know, what we want to say, first of all, is that, you know, we, that was one of our affiliates and they went beyond our terms of agreement. And we'll let you know that we've cut them from our thing and we've updated our terms of service. And we'll let you know that we respect. And I thought, who am I listening to? Is this a ransomware leader or the head of Microsoft? I mean, it sounded like PR crisis management 101. Right. And then I thought the guy is the CEO. He's in charge of a multi hundred million to billion dollar company. He's probably been the CEO at some other company, and he just happens to be in this unethical criminal activity, but he is a CEO. He's got payroll to make. He's got people to bribe. He's got to get developers you know, in to help update his stuff. He's got to have network and distribution. These yeah. guys are corporate people. Right. Well, he doesn't pay a lot of taxes, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I always say, you know, like people like, oh, they must be hidden. No, the number one ransomware leader that we have identified lives in Russia uh, in their main city and he drives a Lamborghini with the license plate of thief in Cyrillic. Wow. <laughs> like it's the it's the opposite of being hidden. Right. And he, he brags about his relationship with the FSB, you know, kind of the Russian uh, CIA. And, you know, they're and they are. They, let me say this. They are paying taxes. I mean, that's one of the big things or, you know, North Korea does ransomware and stealing cryptocurrency to fund their nuclear uh, program and feed their citizens. It is a way that that country thrives. I mean, because of all the sanctions on them, they steal it. Uh, and, and anybody, that, if you're in uh, Korea, North Korea, if you're in Iran, if you're in Russia, if you're in China and you're bringing in revenue, you're bringing in revenue and, and tax structure. They're paying salaries. They're paying bribes. People are making money. Yeah. It's just not, they're probably not identifying that as their source of income. They probably got some other business they're running, I guess, like the meat business or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. So based, one thing that really intrigued me when I was uh, reading through the ransomware book is you kind of netted everything out into nine uh, exploit root causes. All exploits kind of come from these root causes. It seems like there's a strategic way to use that to make maybe generate or measure your progress over time or validate Instead of having to worry about, like you mentioned, all the latest techniques and everything, if you try and um, hold the root cause in, you know, front and center, it seems like a problem of nine, nine root causes is a lot easier to solve than a thousand or a hundred thousand different ways someone could get in. Have you ever given any thought to that and how people can use that over time to mature and create defense in depth? And yeah, I got to send you a check. I wrote a book on it called Data Driven Computer Defense, but 
So, yeah, so I noticed, I started collecting what are the ways that malware and hackers break in about 22 years ago. And pretty soon, let me say the list is morphed a little bit. I called things different things and I categorized things, but it's really, what I was amazed is that over the last 20 years, it's the same thing. And even though the platforms and the things they're attacking are, are, are different, possibly, it's really the same types of attacks. I mean, you know, first ransomware program, 1989, right? It's not new, but let me say, People focus, if I could say anything, what is the thing that I would most want to communicate to any listener? It's that you need to focus less on ransomware or whatever you're worried about, past the hash attacks or you know whatever. It, it, you need to focus on the root causes of exploitation because there's like nine, maybe 10, depending on how you categorize them. Number one being social engineering and unpatched software and then authentication attacks, number three, and they haven't changed over the entirety of computers. Social engineering and unpatched software, number one, number two, 30 years ago, they still are. When you've got ransomware, ransomware is not your problem. It feels like your problem, especially if you're encrypted and having down and having to pay all that money. But it's how the ransomware got in that is your real problem. What I mean by that is that you could just totally wipe away. It's supposed like a wave of wand and go, okay, ransomware is no more. Because I lived in the day when ransomware wasn't here. I'm going to probably be alive when ransomware is handled and not such a big problem. If you don't close the holes that allow people into your devices and environment, it's just going to be something else. It's going to be some other type of hacker or remote access Trojan or some key logging Trojan. Your problem isn't ransomware. That is a symptom of your real problem. Let me say, if someone's breaking into your house, right? And you got all these people breaking into your house and they're stealing different things all the time. Well, the problem isn't what they're stealing when you're in what, when they're in your house, it's how they're getting into your house. Is it the doors? Is it the windows of the floor, attic, roof, basement? If you don't figure out how they're breaking into your house and close those holes, when you arrest the thief that's in your house, it's just going to be other thieves coming. And that's what I'm saying about concentrate on how people are breaking into your devices more. It's easier, it's 10 things, versus concentrating on the 18,803 vulnerabilities we had announced last year. And it, it really is, the there is no way to solve computer security without focusing on just those nine things. Every, everything else is um, a waste of time. It is an absolute waste of time. What most of us were, and you know, it's so weird, so, at least 90% of all successful attacks are due to social engineering and unpatched software. Yet the average organization only spends about 5% or less to mitigate those two problems. So we're buying and looking at all these shiny objects and a lot of them, you know, and listen, that's why I work at No before. I know I'm running on here, but I worked at Microsoft for 11, 12 years. I was doing advanced Windows security stuff. I was doing multi-factor authentication. I was doing PKI. I was putting in all these advanced systems and, all, and I was doing it on time, on budget. I was winning awards and I was getting promoted to Microsoft. Every one of my customers still got hacked. How did they get hacked? Unpatched software and social engineering. Right. <laughs> and I started to realize, hey, am I focusing on the right problem? Right. It turns out I wasn't. So I, I literally, that's why I left Microsoft and went to know before. I was like, okay, I started looking, okay, who's fighting this problem? Social engineering, know before, that's why I am where they are. But it is we all should focus more on it. And anytime we're not, we're being distracted against the top two problems. That is, uh, it just, it seems so simple on the, on the far end. Uh, then one area that's kind of uh, near, near my heart, two areas that I think have kind of evolved as part of this whole thing is a lot of the insurance companies mm. requiring things like multi-factor, but then in parallel, you got identity and access management systems and, you know, and sometimes you might get one of those shoved down your throat as part of a different project, not necessarily a security project. So your your attack surface, I guess, is varying all the time. Some some initiatives of yours, some of the companies to try and uh, make things easier to use. I guess, can you give us any advice on what you see going on now with it? How do you effectively go about doing, you know, uh, multi-factors? Uh, you can do it tactically, I guess, one thing at a time. You can look at some of these big identity and access management systems. Uh, how do you see people the best approach to Short and long-term vision on that. On multi-factor authentication? And just, yeah, you know, how does that, yeah, how do you make sure that, obviously, probably some systems are require different types. How do you make it more of a strategic initiative versus a yeah. tactical? So, yeah, so, you know, I do think that everybody should use multi-factor authentication where they can to secure critical data and systems. And uh, whenever you go to implement MFA, you'll find out that 
the most popular MFA solution, Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, RSA Secure IDs, YubiKeys, whatever, they don't, they don't uh, protect 2% of the world's websites and services and applications. Like you, you have to figure out what you want to protect. And then you try to pick a solution that will protect those critical things. And I say a lot of people will pick a single sign-on solution, you know, uh, like one login or uh, OK, Okta. Yeah, yeah, Okta. And then you figure out, and, and they're only going to work with a handful of MFA solutions. So you're kind of pigeonholed into what you're allowed to do. But let me say this. This is, a, I'm getting ready to write an article. It'll be coming out next week. I've been writing about it for a couple of months. And that is, you, if you're going to go, if you're not in MFA today, or even if you are, uh, but you consider an MFA, you should pick a solution that is not easily fishable. Uh, 80, 90% of MFA is easily fishable, meaning I, as an attacker, can send you an email. And if I trick you to clicking on the link, I get by your MFA. And let me say, it isn't just me. The U.S. government has said this now twice, both in 2021 and 2022, and executive order clarifications. They literally have this language going, do not use easily fishable MFA, which includes uh, SMS-based, uh, voice call-based, push-based, one-time codes. As soon as they said one-time codes, it's got to knock you off your seat because that is the majority. That and SMS are pretty much the solutions today. Right. And the U let me say, the U.S. government is not known for being on the forefront of uh, trends. Right. If the U.S. government is telling you to do something in official paperwork, they have got data for years and are basically being forced by the pain to tell people to do something. So right. that's what I'll say is if you're going to MFA, and I'm going to write an article coming out soon, next week, I don't know when this airs, but I, I, you know, in that, I, I'm going to tell people, if you're going to go to MFA, try to use one of the solutions that is not easily fishable. And unfortunately, the vast majority of it's easily fishable, but there are solutions out there that are not easily fishable. What I would tell viewers, if you're going to pick MFA, ask the MFA vendor or yourself, is there a way that someone could send you an email and then you get tricked into putting in the code or whatever it might be, or plugging in the key or whatever, that it could then go to a fake website, yep. then to the real website, what's called a man in the middle proxy. Right. And, and, and the vast majority of MFA is susceptible to that trick and the better forms, and again, there's there's a lot of them out there, but it's interesting. It's just being able to concentrate. Like Microsoft and Google sell the stuff that's more secure and not as easily fishable, but it's not what they mostly sell. Same thing with Duo and other things, or a YubiKey. You, you know, YubiKey from Yubico, you know, the little USB keys, or whatever. They sell a version, uh, the ver I think the most popular version. You can buy it and use it any way you want, but one of the, the same key could be used with what's called FIDO. FIDO is one of the things that's not easily fishable. FIDO, fast identity, fast on identity online or something. Uh, yeah. But that, that those types of solutions are one of the types that are not easily fishable. So the YubiKey can actually be activated in FIDO, non-FIDO mode. And what I would encourage people is, well, activate the FIDO mode because then it's not easily fishable. So sometimes it's just being educated, being aware of the issue so that you can enable a feature set with the MFA that you buy that makes it less likely to be compromised or bypassed. So is there any more... Uh... You said you had an article coming out on some of that. Update your kind of the last book, I guess. Uh, the yeah, it's good. Yeah, so the first, it's going to be a two-part article. The first part is going to be don't use easily fishable MFA. And then I'm going to follow it with here's the MFA that I like. And I'm going to try to list every MFA solution that is not easily fishable. And, and it was interesting because some I went to a authentication. I spoke. I was a keynote at a, at a FIDO conference in Seattle last year called Authenticate. And uh, there was a spokesperson from Microsoft and they said, use MFA, any MFA, even weak MFA. And, and, and I think that's the wrong advice because the majority of reason why people are going to MFA is so that they can't be easily fished out of their password. But if you're going to an MFA that can be easily bypassed using the exact same trick, click on this fake link, <laughs> then you're going to make people go through a lot of heartache to end up in the same position of vulnerability. And let me say, there's bots that are stealing people's MFA credentials by the millions. This isn't a, th let me say again, US government doesn't recommend something because it's theoretically gonna happen in the future. <laughs> They're doing it because they have the data to show that it's occurring too much in the past. And, but it's, it's a new mindset. Like uh, most people you know, don't know it. Most people don't even know how easy 
uh, your MFA solution can be fished or bypassed. And when I show them the Kevin Mitnick video, if you want to look it up, look up Kevin Mitnick MFA video, especially the one with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the most popular one. When the people see that, I look out in the audience and there's 99 people going. Our pen testers, we have some, you know, usually register domains about six months before we do a pen test, a very similar domain. And it's a very easy thing to pull off. Yeah, and let me say, I used to love push-based authentication until I talked to your company. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to actually recommend push-based authentication as one of the secure methods I want. And yeah. then I was talking to your pen testers and like, we blow by that. Like we're sitting outside of, I love, I love the quote. I uh, forget the guy they told, but like we're sitting outside of a New York City apartment building and we just hit all the buttons. <laughs> you know, there's, there's somebody waiting on the pizza guy that's going to let us in. And then I started right. doing research. I started doing research. Yeah, it turns out like it's up to 30% of people when they're sent the, hey, is this you logging in? will say yes when they're not logging in. <laughs> and I don't know if it's an education problem or a deployment problem, but I've changed my mind on push-based authentication. I, I need to put a little asterisk and go, you need to appropriately educate your employees that if they're not logging in, they should say no and call IT security. <laughs> right. No, I, didn't, couple, I didn't think we had to share that part. I thought it was, I thought it was kind of implicit. <laughs> I think there's kind of a the way the brain works thing. If you're focused on something else, and you know, just you just kind of be the you go into robot mode a little bit. Yeah, um, and the pen test. I talked to some other pen testers, and they were like, "Yeah, we love it when we come across a client's got push based authentication." You know, yeah. and let me say, it's really the push base where you don't have. There's some push base where you have to still put in the pen or something, or do some type of login, and then you get the push. Right. That's good. It's right. the ones that it's single factor and yeah. all they're asking you, they, they say, oh, well, the second factor is the phone, <laughs> right? And then the MFA push is number two. The reality is it's kind of like 1.5 factor. Right. And, 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 you know, again, if they were required to actually put in something to go, okay, now I'm logging in at this time. I think if they, if they go, oh, I'm not putting in the factor. What's this? There, maybe there'd be some disconnect that would make them see it better. So the other thing that you're big on is, uh, you know, tweaking your controls around local intelligence gathering. Can you uh, give us an idea of what, what you'd consider the top two or three local intelligence things? And is, what's the role of some of these uh, services that just provide all kinds of threat information? You know, and how, how valuable is that? Or you know, what, what is that? What, what, do you, what, what do you mean by that specifically, I guess? I tell people to value local collected intelligence over far away intelligence. Like a lot of people, you know, they get a report from Symantec or Microsoft. And like, oh, my God, that's what I need to be worried about. What I said is that really has the least impact upon your environment. What you really should do is look at what are the actual attackers and malware trying to do in your environment and then focus on that. Use and, and, and you know, and, and then after you if you can or you haven't collected data on your environment, maybe your industry, your competitors, and let it move out. But the closer that the intelligence collection is to you, the more valuable it is. And I mean, and it's really simple things. Like I always tell people like, well, I can't collect that information. One of the easiest ways is like almost everybody's running antivirus or endpoint detection, and they will give you a monthly report telling you, here's all the malware stuff that we detected. You can take the top 10, the top 10 usually you know, compromise 90, 99% of what they detect. You know, it's the bug of the month that's trying to break in. And um, you can actually literally spend five minutes looking them up and find out how they actually infect people. Most of them only come in one, maybe two ways. So you can literally collect the top 10 malware programs that were detected and removed by your systems, spend five minutes, maybe 30 minutes tops, researching how they actually spread. Is it social engineering? Is it Word documents? Is it unpatched software? Is it misconfigured websites or whatever? And literally quickly go, oh, okay. It looks like this. 60% of these things got in because of social engineering, 20% because of patching. And oh, we have a log, you know, log 4J, you know, vulnerability or something like that. But so you can collect that information and then go, okay, this is how they're trying to break into us. And this is, okay, if it's a lot of it's social engineering, we got to figure out the policies and the technical defenses and education to fight social engineering. Oh, look at this. 20% of it was because of unpatched software. What's that unpatched software? Is it Adobe Acrobat? Is it, you know, Edge? What is it? And, and so you can use your local intelligence to harden your environment 
and, you know, and, and, and see immediate results. Instead, everybody's always trying to do 200 things, you know, oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. They see their problems like bubbles in a glass of champagne. And what the cybersecurity world doesn't tell you is two or three of those bubbles are far bigger than all the other bubbles in those glass. And so spend a little bit of time figuring out what your two biggest bubbles are and concentrate on those first and best. All right. What about the expanded tax surface with the public clouds, the Amazons, the Azures, any, anything you're seeing there, you know, there's the content security profile management or configuration management solutions that will kind of look, make sure all the high level X's and O's are crossed. Is there, is there anything that people should be aware of there beyond? You know, I, in general, I kind of like clouds uh, because I mean, for a lot of reasons, cost and stuff, but really, I like clouds because if you're attacked by ransomware, even when they do attack the cloud, the cloud provider typically has a really good backup and restore solution and you'll be back up faster. And I, and let me say, we're seeing the ransomware guys start to attack the cloud more. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, I think we're going to see more of that in the future and maybe there won't be as much safety in the cloud. So anything you can do to help manage the cloud experience you know, like what's interesting, if there is an attack on your on-premises network, you have the ability to control what events that you take and what events that you read and react to. But if it goes up into the cloud, like if someone's beating on the cloud on your password, let's say, you may or may not get a report. You know, maybe Microsoft and Google send you a report, but not every cloud, you know, maybe if they're, and let me say, I'm just making this up, but, you know, maybe right. Salesforce or something, you know, they're beating on some app that your company uses. Will you ever get the report that someone was banging away at your password? You don't know. So I do think that, you know, you have to educate yourself, talk to your cloud service providers about what type of information and telemetry they provide you, what other type of, you know, tools and techniques and access brokers can you do to try to help protect your experience? Uh, because, I, you know, certainly the attackers are going to focus on more in the cloud in the future. I even heard the term uh, ransom cloud today uh, and had to comment mm -hmm. on that in a, in a press thing. But they're absolutely going to concentrate on the cloud because more and more people are going to the cloud. And if they don't, they're going to have a limited, smaller pool of customers. So absolutely, certainly, are they going to go to the cloud? And you have to ask yourself, what am I losing during that transition? What am I gaining? And try to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. Have you, you see anything going on or how are people handling like the whole kind of the consumerization internet of things and the impact of that on networks? Yeah, that, that, that's a horrible mess. Uh, almost every IoT device is horribly insecure, uh, will remain horribly insecure. Uh, it is ripe for the picking. I don't know why we don't learn our mistakes like, oh, you know, we went from here to there and we can apply this with these security lessons. This is how we can protect our results. No, we just tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. And Internet of Things is just horrible. I mean, even, you know, some of the top viruses now, I, you know, I go to look at the top 10 malware things and I'm like, I don't even recognize these viruses, right? It's not like the, the viruses and Trojans of old. It's like DVR viruses and stuff, because it turns out that some of the top selling, you know, top replicating malware worms and bots are attacking your web cameras and your, you know, and your Wi-Fi routers and your security switches. And that is just the future. And let me say again, I, I'm on all these things. So Cloud Security Alliance, World Economic Forum, and boy, are we concerned about IoT. And we're even, can I get my quantum crypto? I need to make sure my quantum safe crypto is on my IoT devices. It's fantastic. It's maybe even thought about by 1% of the IoT guys. The rest of the people are getting some cloud inserted, you know, some chip inserted on some little device. And they're clueless about security. I mean, that, that is 99% of it out there. It is, uh, it's bad. And uh, okay. good luck trying to solve that problem. Yep. Well, it'll, it'll rear its ugly head at some point and then, then it'll become a priority like all these things. Tell me a little bit about the future of uh, Novi4. What kind of things, I know, at our summit, we talked a little bit about some of the very real looking business email compromise type deals. And uh, you know, what, what do you see on th for the training world, really see that evolving and how, how, what, what's, what's new in the scope there? Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I gotta tell you the thing I'm most proud about is our, what's called our Inside Man series. It's mm -hmm. sophisticated user training. It looks kind of like a Netflix series. We're on season four, I think just got released. 
And I literally have the only time in my entire career where I've heard employees email us going, hey, when's the next episode coming out? I don't go of employee security training. You're asking us to train you more. Yep, they're hooked. And let me say, God bless Stu, the CEO, and all the other people who decide to make, <laughs> you know, make Inside Man. It's pretty fantastic. But uh, certainly what we're seeing is just scams everywhere. And I think, let's say early on, we were more concentrated on just corporate scams, business email compromise scams. But now there are so many scams everywhere and people are being scammed at home from people pretending to be police officers, IRS, your energy company, there's romance scams, there's SMS things coming into people all the time. And I think what we realized and changed our mindset was, is that even if the scam, like a romance scam is not usually directly financially related to a corporation, if you've got an employee that's dealing with losing thousands or millions of dollars from a romance scam, that is an unproductive employee. <laughs> they're right. not working for your business during the time they're handling that situation. So we're, we're spreading out our education to talk about more types of scams, uh, you know, beyond just traditional business scams. And we're even, I've got this thing, I teach it this way, no matter how the message comes to you, whether it's email, SMS, social media, voice call, email, person, someone's in person trying to scam you, scams usually have these four traits. The message, wherever it arrives, arrives unexpectedly. Number two, it's asking you to do something you've never done before for that requester. Mm -hmm. Number three, it's uh, usually got a stressor event saying that you have to do it quickly, or you'll be arrested, you'll lose money, drop business. And number four, if doing performing that request could hurt your interest or your organization's interest, don't do the request. You need to now verify this request using an alternate safe method, calling on a known good phone number, going directly to the company's website. But that's what I, so I think a part of my education, part of Nova Force education is how can we change what's called, we call the culture. How can we change the security culture of organizations and people to just have this default level of skepticism to be aware of the traits of what might be a scam? Because I can't warn you, you know, or this, you know, last week I was writing about Facebook scams and then QR code scams. And like every week there's some new type of scam. There's going to be cloud scams in the future, IoT scams or whatever. And you, you really have a hard time keeping up with the sheer number of them. But the traits of scams are relatively the same and remain the same. And if you can just teach, it's like teaching, you're holding your kid's hand, young kid's hand as you walk off a curb and you go, hey, look right, look left, look right. Then you go across the street. After you teach it enough, that kid's looking right, left, right without you having to ask. Well, that's what we want to do with employees is mm -hmm. give them enough education that it just becomes instilled in them and the organization and the culture to be skeptical of things that could be a scam. It's kind of funny. My wife, Marsha, she takes the week to get the scam of the week that comes out from an OB4 and she forwards it to the entire family every week. So, oh, cool. She's seeing I, I value love, in that. She's doing I that. I love that idea. I yeah. love that idea. More more people should do that because you know, the scams of the weeks or the months or whatever, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of telemetry from, you know, tens of thousands of customers and getting to right. see what comes out. They're like, this week, COVID's really big or the COVID test or whatever, or maybe it's a Super Bowl scam or, you know, right. the earthquake scam. And, and that, yeah, that's part of us keeping up with the latest scams. Mm-hmm. So Kirk, right. how, how, how do you guys, uh, how, does, how does Synercom use Nobafor? Uh, for ourselves and we sell it to our clients as a recommendation, like uh, we had mentioned, Roger, that you know the number one thing is you got to not get caught, first of all, in the social engineering. So a lot of companies will have that or they've tried something or they do it in-house. Uh, so we, we, we sell it and we also use it ourselves to keep ourselves from getting in trouble. Like I said, my wife takes it and forwards it to the whole immediate family every week, the scam of the week thing, so that you know, everybody wants to think they're going to win the lottery, I guess. And they always are hopeful that it might be their big day, right? They got this email that showed them that Microsoft's giving away a million dollars and you won. So, uh, yeah, we uh, we use it both internally and we like we do with a lot of all the controls that we'd like to facilitate. And then we run our own network and then we help customers position it in their networks also. Well, well thank you for your support. You know, I always tell people, Usually everybody's got the right policies. Usually everybody's got content filtering and antivirus and you got all the things where you're trying to stop it from getting to your end users, but you do have to educate people because 
No, I've been waiting for the, hey, these scams are going to stop for 30 years. And it just seems like it's getting worse every day still for right now. And as long as it's bad, we need to educate people how to recognize bad things and then how to treat them, which is to report them on IT or help desk or delete at the very least delete them. Right. You know, that, 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 so training, you know, that's usually the under the underappreciated role in it. Yep. And it's a very critical role. Like you mentioned, it's I mean, the, the social engineering is one primary way pen testing gets in. Uh, passwords, uh, that's all those, the, the, those are the two easiest ways by far. When you do, you're getting in in an hour, that's usually the way you're getting in. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Roger, I got two more questions test. before we uh, before we wrap this up here. Um, first off, congrats. I just saw that you guys released your earnings. <clears throat> um, significant growth year over year. I know that you were up revenue was like over 40% year over year growth. But one thing that caught my eye was like 47,000 customers. And I don't know how much that's up for the year, but I just was kind of curious. I mean, it's probably all over the base place, but where are you seeing most of your customer growth? Because that's a lot of customers. Yeah, you know, I'm actually not sure what I'm supposed to talk about since I'm a trusted insider and we're not allowed to talk for three days before or after our release. But I'm assuming... Let's assume that I'm sharing what's only publicly known, but uh, the uh, you know certainly we're reaching out to more and more places around the globe. You know, is a big part of it. I think, you know, that's just a natural extension of it. But yeah, you know, I think our early concentration was you know smaller businesses. Now moved, you know, as you grow as a business, you have the ability to scale and sell to more scalable places. But certainly, you know, I think a big part of our growth has been uh, more and more countries. You know, so we're in that that's been a big reflection of that. But yeah, I, I love a result. I love working for a company, uh, you know, that, that does well and people like the products. And it's interesting. I've only I've been with No Before now just going on four years. When I first joined, when someone said, I'd say, oh, I worked for No Before. And they'd go, what's No Before? And about two years ago, somehow that changed. And they're like, oh, I know y'all. Or oh, I failed one of your phishing emails. That's like the most common thing I hear. I go, hey, I failed two of our phishing emails. You're not alone. <laughs> but it is it has made me it made me realize that I, as smart as I think I am that I am scammable and now I am like a freak about not clicking on something like if it comes to me and it's got a link in it I'm hovering I'm looking at it I'm giving it due consideration before I click it and I would say it's all you know before no before tested me I didn't think you could trick me now I know that I can be tricked and it makes me be a little bit more cautious that I'm human uh, mm -hmm. so if you've been tricked I've been tricked, although I will say knock on wood, it seems to have been a good year or plus since I've been tricked. So I'm, I'm hoping to keep that going. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, my last question is, what is the picture behind you? Oh, I, I love this. So this is the computing, Alan Turing's computing bombs, B-O-M-B-E-S. So, uh, you know, Alan Turing was the British guy that figured out how to break the German Enigma code. So prior to, so these were the first uh, mechanical computers, or at least one of the first, uh, but he figured out how he could crack the German's Enigma. Uh, it was a German uh, Enigma had this symmetric code that was really difficult. It would have uh, four or six digits uh, used as their kind of the encryption cipher. And he realized how he could crack it, but he's like, oh, they said, you'd have to guess tens of thousands of times. And he's like, he's like, yep, we'll just build thousands of these things. So he made that uh, over in, in their huts. And uh, before we broke the German Enigma code, the Allies had never won a battle against the Germans. And after we made that machine, we never lost a battle. And it uh, seems to be that they think that it made the war end about two to four years earlier than it otherwise would have, saving millions and millions of lives on both sides. So, you know, good thing. Interesting. Very so cool. I'm, a, I'm a crypto nerd. It's, a, <laughs> it's computing <laughs> bombs, they call them. B-O-M-B-E-S. Alan Turing. What was that movie? It was they did the theory of everything or something like? No, no, oh, that, yeah. was it. No, that was a different guy. That was uh, yeah. that was a different guy. But Alan Turing, yeah. he's a he was a nice. smart cool. dude. Cool. Well, Roger, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for being part of IT Trendsetters, Kirk. It's always a pleasure. Well, thank you. Till next time. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.